Uh, welcome everyone to the Faculty of Arts, uh, Waterloo Arts Distinguished Lecture in Economics, the inaugural. Uh, I'm Tim Kenyon, I'm Associate Dean of Arts for Research. Uh, to an increasing extent, uh, scholars interested in practically any natural or social phenomenon are well served by an understanding of the core concepts and methods of economics. It's perhaps unsurprising that a discipline focusing on the manifestations of economic activity in all its ast astonishing diversity should have uh, developed methods and explanatory categories with such uh, expressive richness and analytical power that they would end up applying with great generality to aspects of all phenomena, sociological, biological, even basically physical. Today, a failure to understand once proprietary concepts like opportunity, cost, or marginal utility, supply and demand, or incentives and disincentives understood at the systemic level does not denote inexpert status on specifically economic questions, but rather a generally incomplete conceptual toolkit for making sense of the world. A field with roots linking it to political theory, sociology, Economics more recently has begun to revisit and deepen its connections to humans as they reason and act on the hoof. Economists are augmenting the powerful and ferociously technical econometric methods that have developed to match the burgeoning era of big data with a more empirically informed understanding of agents as people with bounded rationality, chaotically imperfect knowledge, and commitments that may not fit neatly into the most mathematically tractable forms of rational choice theory, sources of friction, as one might say. Speaking as an outsider to the discipline, it's an exciting time to see the continued development and new directions of economics. Informed citizens, researchers, and decision makers all have good reason for looking to economists for insight and illumination on vexing questions that go well beyond the most obviously economic topics. It is for this reason that the Faculty of Arts is pleased to support the Waterloo Arts Distinguished Lectures in Economics, which will be inaugurated today. At the intersection of public education and broad scholarly engagement, these lectures give us all a chance to see how one of the broadest and most methodologically diverse disciplines is approaching a range of topics that hold meaning and have consequences for everyone. To that end, we have a lecture today from Professor Randall Wright. I will leave it uh, to Matt uh, to introduce Professor Wright. For my part, I would like to welcome everyone to this great event and thank the organizers for helping make it happen and invite you to enjoy today's lecture. So it's uh, with great pleasure that we have uh, Professor Wright from the University of uh, Wisconsin with us today. Um, it's with no exaggeration at all that I can say that he's one of the most important working macroeconomic theorists um, in the profession today. Um, throughout his career, he's made important contributions uh, to our understanding of labor markets, um, business cycles, and monetary and financial economics. His most important contributions have been in the area of monetary theory, um, where he pioneered the approach uh, uh, of using search theory to understand monetary phenomena. And his research in this area is characterized by a focus on the underlying frictions um, in economic exchange that, that make money uh, an essential feature of pretty much all modern economies. Um, his work in this area addresses central issues about the existence of money as a as a medium of exchange and um, and the way that monetary economies function that might differ from a non-monetary economy. Um, Professor Wright's also pursued the implications of, of these kind of deep underlying um, theory of money uh, for monetary policy and, and for policy makers and I think it's fair to say that over the last two decades, he's probably been the single most important person responsible for pushing policymakers and central bankers into taking monetary theory and the foundations of a monetary economy uh, seriously. Though it's not clear that that one's been decisively won yet. Um, his more recent work extends the same kind of 
interest in the underlying frictions in the economy and, and what institutions arise from those frictions and, and how they affect economic outcomes to not just straight money but to broader aspects of the financial system. Um, and this bridges an important gap um, between conventional macroeconomics and the study of finance. His work today is, is in that vein and he's going to talk to us today about the implications of those kinds of frictions um, on innovation and growth. Um, and without further introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Wright and, and take it away. Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from Winnipeg. I now live in Wisconsin. I didn't think I could come to a colder place to give a talk than Wisconsin, but you guys have been very hospitable. It's just like being in Winnipeg here. This is a joint paper with uh, Jonathan Chu and Cesar May, who happen to be PhDs from uh, Western Ontario, and now both of the Bank of Canada. Jonathan's a bit like my grandchild. He's a student of Miguel Malico, who was my student. So I'm feeling kind of old. When Jonathan starts having students, I'm going to be ready to retire, I think. And these guys are good economists. They understand uh, monetary theory very well, and it's important, I think. I'm going to try to make the case today why this is not about money per se, but it's going to make the case that monetary phenomena or monetary issues having to deal with frictions is really quite important for, for economic performance. So let me begin. So here's the motivation. So new ideas are really important for economic performance and for economic growth. Uh, by economic performance, I mean just the level of activity and the well-being of society. But a key component to your well-being is economic growth. We're way better off than our parents were and way, way better off than our grandparents. And as you trace it back, growth is what really leads to societies coming out of the dark ages and, and emerging where people can have a sustained level of, of well-being. Not only can we have some people doing very well, we can also start being more equitable when you have more resources to go around. And what drives growth? Well. It's, it's, it's new ideas, it's knowledge improving. You know, part of it is just ca capital. We have better machines, more factories, but it's not just physical capital, it's, it's human capital, the intellectual knowledge that we use for both production and organizing economic institutions. Now, in economics generally, there's really two big issues. First is production. In the context of knowledge, I want to address the issue, how does society work towards providing incentives to generate the right amount of research so that we can get ideas emerging. And the second part of economics is exchange. This has been neglected quite a bit in growth theory, in my opinion. As with any other notion of exchange, you want to get things into the hands of those who are best able to use them. And with ideas, it's not so well known to economic theorists, I believe, but outside of formal economics and in the business community and, and some other areas of academic research, the person who comes up with an idea is not necessarily the best person to implement that. And I know from my own work that I have all these good ideas, but you know, I don't know how to run a regression, so I need co-authors or I need to pass my ideas on to people with better expertise, better talent, or at least comparative advantage. With ideas, it's kind of complicated um, for lots of reasons, and I'll try to describe that. But basically, I want to emphasize the process of the reallocation of ideas is not frictionless. Uh, these aren't traded the same way that you would you know, buy fruit at the vegetable stand or even sell your labor services on the job market. Uh, because you're trading information or knowledge, there's a distinction between the personal costs and benefits to knowledge creation and the social costs and benefits. Knowledge is a public good. It's one of the few policy um, prescriptions I'm very happy to advocate. Uh, governments have to subsidize research. Professors should be paid more. <laughs> because what we're creating not only gives us some good, but it does society a lot of good. And you know, in some areas, you patent your ideas and sell them and commercialize them. But a lot of the stuff we're doing in economics and in, in research much more generally is creating knowledge that will be passed down and be useful for generations to come. So, so where markets tend not to work is with goods that are public in nature. Markets work better when, when, when you don't have public goods. Nobody wants to pay for the new park or the better highway or research, but we all share in it. So we need governments to subsidize it. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I think more importantly from this perspective of this project, the reallocation of ideas is, is complicated. It's, it's rife with frictions. Uh, just like marriage markets or labor markets, it's getting the right people together that counts. So if I have a real good idea for some empirical work, and then you know I ask uh, one of my good theorist friends, they're not going to be able to help me. You've got to get the person with the idea matched up with someone who's, who has particular expertise in implementing that idea. So you've got to match people. And that's a time-consuming process. It doesn't always work out perfectly. Although just like the job market or the marriage market, you don't wait for the perfect match. At some point, you've got to, start look, you've got to stop looking for a partner and start doing something. There's also liquidity involved. Uh, liquidity is a hot topic in, in economics and finance these days. A lot of people are talking about it. Most people don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's full of jargon and uh, ill-conceived ideas. So but we've been working in monetary theory on this. I have for 25 years, and, and we're standing on the shoulders of some giants. Uh, monetary economics brings a lot to the table here. Monetary economics is about how people pay for stuff. Not only using currency, but you know, using other assets to make payments or using assets to collateralize loans. And we have some expertise that I want to bring to bear on the growth problem. Interestingly, there's a long history of people thinking that financial innovation is important for, for the dissemination of knowledge and, and, and the implementation of ideas. But there's not, really some, there's not really a lot of good models about how financial development or how financial processes in general affect growth. I'm going to propose one. And by the way, if there are any questions of clarifying nature or otherwise, feel free to stop me at any point. OK, so here we go. So I'm going to build a growth model. I, I didn't make special slides for the university-wide lecture. I don't want to come here pretending to be something I'm not. I'm an economist. And I'm going to show you slides. I'll, I'll play down some of the equations. But these slides were designed for an audience of economists. And let's just see if we can pull it together and see what happens. So we're going to build a formal model. That's what economists do. We can't run controlled experiments that easily because it's costly. And you know, it's one thing when the rats die. It's another thing when Argentina tanks. <laughs> so you can't, you can't just start experimenting. We build artificial economies, and we do experiments on these artificial economies. The artificial economies are populated by individuals, by, by virtual individuals, who behave in some goal-oriented fashion. And they face constraints, and we see what emerges. So this um, economy, this model, will be populated by producers. And the art of economics, as is probably true of most sciences, you want to strip away all the fancy, realistic descriptions of the world and hone it down to something that's simple enough to understand, yet maintains the essence of the key ideas. So this is going to look fairly artificial, but that's good. Good science is supposed to not build pictures of reality, but, but usable models that can inform us about the world. So in my world, all individual producers have access to some frontier technology, Z. I didn't say Z, I said Z, you'll notice. <laughs> they also come up with new ideas for innovations. At the beginning, I'm going to walk you through a sequence of increasingly complicated models. And at some simple version, we're going to have these ideas just appearing randomly. Later on, you'll have to engage in effort and use resources to come up with ideas. And this will increase their individual productivity giving them some profit advantage in the shorter run. Although, as is true of the world, in the model, these ideas which improve individual technology will soon um, trans transit into the public domain and other people can use them. That's why knowledge is a public good. And I'm going to put in this, this key, I think, rather novel. Some other people are working on it these days. But when we started this project, it was rather novel. Uh, notion that ideas are going to be traded, and the market where they're traded is, is, is fraught with frictions, including search frictions. You've got to find a good partner. Uh, bargaining frictions. Uh, your partner may try to rip you off after you meet. Um, my favorite example of this was my best friend in high school, Steve Rose, who was living in St. John, New Brunswick. And I got weightlifting equipment for Christmas, and I got tired of it at some point. So he offers me $25 for my weights. Great. We go down to the base. We carry up all the weights, put them in his dad's station wagon. He says, I'll give you $12. <laughs> I 
This is called the holdup problem in economics. <laughs> and it's, it's very important. If you just study competitive markets, it never comes up. But I'm going to talk about agents who are bargaining. And you know, I was naive. Of course, in, if I had been rational, or at least less naive, I might not have entered into the agreement in the first place, because I know once I make the investment of carrying these weights upstairs, he's going to try to rip me off. So this leads to underproduction of ideas, of, of activity in general, but research in particular. So I'm going to talk about that. And then I'm going to show you something that's not so obvious. The reason we do formal economics is not only to, to make our results precise, but sometimes new insights pop up. And this last point, you know, I, I had no idea this was going to emerge. But I'm going to show you a particular way in which financial intermediation uh, helps get around this holdup problem, and hence is one of the engines of economic growth. Okay, so that's sort of a roadmap. Oh, there's some related work, but you know, it's no good, so let's just skip it. <laughs> You're obligated to have a slide containing related work in economics, I presume in other sciences. Uh, but you know, if you want to see your name, you have to look at the paper. Here's an environment. So an economic model is, as I say, it's described by putting individuals, these virtual individuals, into a situation and seeing how they behave. So the first thing you've got to specify is how things evolve over time. I'm using discrete time. That's convenient. Uh, so, so periods are indexed by t, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Now, we like to think of there being a large number of agents. For some economic problems, you, uh, intra-family bargaining, you might want to model two agents, maybe husband and wife, maybe add a kid or a grandparent. No, but I want to think of this as the large economy. In that sense, it's a macro theory. And uh, what does large mean? Well, economists like to think of themselves as doing a little bit of math, so I mean a set of measure one. And of this set of agents, there's three types. So n sub i is the measure. Measure means fraction. There's a measure n i of people who are potential innovators, and they can come up with ideas. There's another um, set of measure NE who are potential entrepreneurs. So think of the former as PhDs and the latter as MBAs. PhDs come up with good ideas. MBAs cannot come up with any ideas, but they know how to make money off of them. <laughs> so sometime a PhD might need an MBA to take his product to the market, or at least to the next level. And then there's just some other agents because uh, I don't want to say everybody in the economy is either a entrepreneur or an innovator. There could just be some regular Joes who, who work and, and, and pay the rent. Uh, preferences in this economy, so the first thing we have to do in economic theory is say, what do agents want? We, we describe that by writing down their preferences. And this person, these individuals, the representative individual, has preferences that say he likes more consumption, he or she likes more consumption, and dislikes working, at least at the margin. So log C is a particular preference specification. For this, for growth theory, logarithmic utilities is kind of important. Uh, it generates nice equilibria. Uh, and then the preferences are linear in hours worked. So chi is just some parameter describing the disutility of labor. And then that, you know, that's completely standard. What's a little bit novel is um, there's a technology that produces output Y using inputs, and the inputs here will be labor. So in the paper, we have a general case where the inputs could be vectors of labor and capital. You can add whatever you want, raw materials, software, whatever. But this production function that maps inputs into outputs is hit with a multiplicative constant, lowercase z, which describes an individual's productivity. So the way economy grows is the mapping from inputs to outputs shifts out over time. So over time, with the same number of hours, you can produce more output. Uh, there's also an asset. In economics, we call it a tree. Bob Lucas thought that was a good way to model an asset. And it, it's a good way to model it. So this is a tree that just kicks out uh, fruit that people like to eat. That's going to be important because I'm going to talk later about people using assets to collateralize loans. So I need some assets. And the simplest asset is a tree. If you own the tree, or if you own a share of the tree, you have some claim on its dividend stream, the fruit that it bears. It's easier to do it that way than say I own shares in General Motors, because General Motors is a very complicated firm. A tree is the simplest possible production process. Now in this environment, we have to start thinking about how knowledge evolves over time. And other economists have thought about that. This is obviously not 
you know, the first attempt to think about it. We're going to do it a particular way, mostly designed for simplicity. The, the ideas here are actually fairly robust, but we want to illustrate how things work with a, a usable example. So in my usable example, innovators come up with a new idea every period, and with some probability, this idea can be implemented successfully, but with some probability, it can't. So when you wake up as an innovator, that day you say, I have an idea which, if successful, will increase my individual productivity from the frontier technology, uppercase Z, to a higher level. I multiply by 1 plus eta. But it only succeeds with some probability sigma. With probability 1 minus sigma, I can't implement successfully, so I just use the frontier technology. This variable sigma uh, captures the idea that skills and ideas aren't always perfectly matched at the individual level. As I said, I have great ideas for empirical work, but I don't know how to run a regression. So if my idea is for a new labor supply regression, you know, it's unlikely to result in a success. I don't have the, my skills don't match that idea. So this diagram on the bottom shows you the way it works. At the beginning of a period, some people are successful, their productivity increases. Others are not, and they use the frontier technology. What we know is over time, individual ideas somehow uh, emerge into the public domain, and we can all use them. Let's keep it simple. Let's say at the start of the next period, anybody can use the new knowledge. So you only have a one period advantage because of your innovation. Nothing is critical about one. It just makes it easier. So here's a diffusion process. In general, the frontier technology next period depends on the entire distribution of productivity across all producers. But the way I've set it up, at any point in time, there's only two types of producers. Successful innovators have a productivity Z times 1 plus eta, and the rest just use the frontier technology Z. So when I integrate across the distribution of individual productivities, it's actually going to be pretty simple. I'm just going to average across high productivity and low productivity producers. Um, but the functional form here is meant to illustrate some particular cases that economists know. I mean, it could be that the frontier technology next period is the average of all of our technologies. Or it could be the maximum. We all stand on the shoulders of the highest person last period. Or we could be dragged down by, you know the way it is in some departments, the productivity department is dragged down by your worst colleague. It's like the O-ring theory, right? When the space shuttle blew up, it was one tiny O-ring that was malfunctioning and the whole space shuttle blew up. But, but our theory doesn't depend on functional forms. These are just some examples uh, of, of examples that economists use in various applications. Okay, now I'm going the right way. Now don't get hung up on this if you're not an economist, or even if you are an economist. <laughs> Again, the way we proceed in economics is we assume agents act in some goal-directed fashion. They try to do well for themselves. But that's too vague of a concept to make it operational, so we make it precise by studying the, the pure extreme case where they actually maximize utility subject constraints. This lays out their mathematical problem. Basically, it says, at any point in time, you maximize your utility function, which is, here it's written U of C, but we're actually going to use the log function, minus the disutility work, plus your continuation value in the future. And you have a budget constraint, that's the first equation, that says you could take your resources that you get from, from your wage income, from owning some shares in the tree, and from produce, or owning shares in production firms, or operating the firm yourself, it doesn't matter, you can allocate that to consumption or buy new assets. The second constraint says that your profits from your enterprise, you're going to choose to employ some people to maximize output minus your wage bill. And there's something on the bottom that talks about how your continuation value depends on whether you innovate or not. I won't dwell on that. There's a variable here which we compute, and you don't need to memorize the formula. Capital delta is just the gain from innovation. So pi is your profit, conditional on your technology. So pi 1 will be the profit of a successful innovator. Pi 0 will be the profit of someone who's using the frontier technology. The difference is the higher profit for people who are successful in innovation. I have to multiply by that chi, by chi over w, to translate profits into utility. And that's just some accounting that I do. And that's not so important. Equilibrium in this theory 
is agents are all going to choose consumption, hours worked, hours supplied, capital H is hours demanded. Agents are going to choose to hold some assets such that given the prices, agents are doing the best they can. And, and market clearing, which means what everybody chooses adds up so that it's feasible. This is all completely standard economics. Okay, <coughs> the reason we use a particular utility function log, it generates a very nice equilibrium called the balanced growth equilibrium. So in equilibrium, all variables except labor grow, and they all grow at the same rate, G. So Z, pr Z prime over Z is the growth rate in the technology process, or productivity. Uh, consumption, wages, other variables will grow at the same rate. But hours will be constant. Why? Because that's what the world looks like. You know, wages, consumption, everything have grown by many fold a factor of many fold over the last century, hours per household are kind of the same. There's ups and downs, but the real world looks like it's characterized by balanced growth, so I want my model to have that. And in my world, the growth rate, this simple example is completely mechanical, the growth rate is going to be some function, capital G of N, where N is the number of successful innovators. So this machinery here, this maybe pseudo formality, whatever you want to call it, I'm shrouding this in mathematical imprecision, um, so I look like a scientist, but no, there's, there's method to this madness. It makes precise the idea that the growth rate of the economy depends in a particular way on the improvements in knowledge, because knowledge increases productivity. And in particular, um, with that functional form I give you for the diffusion process, you get a nice little closed form solution for the growth rate. Rho is some exogenous component. We're just getting smarter over time, I don't know, for genetic reasons or better nutrition. But in addition to Rho, the endogenous component of the increase in knowledge, we take the successful innovators. How many are they? Well, there's N of them. One plus eta is uh, their relative productivity advantage. I average that with the unsuccessful innovators, there's one minus n of those, and I aggregate it according to a particular function, and there you go, that gives you a functional form describing the frontier of technology next period as a function of where we are, and how many people came up with successful new ideas. Now, the interesting part will come pretty soon. Uh, first, yes, first, if we just take the number of innovators to be some number, then it's purely a random variable how many are successful. But what if agents have to actually invest in research? So in this example, I'm going to put a cost, kappa, subscript i, because i for innovator. This cost kappa is the cost you pay you know, to get a PhD. You have to do some reading and some writing and other stuff. So not everybody wants to be an innovator. Uh, because why? Well, if there's many innovators, there's, this is kind of subtle, but this is the way it works, and I think it's somewhat realistic. If there's a lot of people going into innovation, productivity is going to grow fast. When productivity is growing, wages are higher. When wages are higher, profits aren't so high. So if there's too much innovation, that kind of chokes off additional innovation by driving profits down. So in equilibrium, some people will become innovators, some will not and they'll be indifferent to doing so or not doing so, it's a standard free entry condition that you'd see in undergraduate industrial organization. Now, one question, why do I always go the wrong way? Must be an Australian pointer or something. <laughs> okay, in this model, there exists a unique equilibrium. The growth rate depends on a bunch of things. It doesn't depend on A, which is the supply of these assets. But the equilibrium is inefficient. But here's the first kind of substantive result, and it's quite, it's quite simple. People do not go into innovation enough because they bear the cost kappa themselves. The benefits, well, they get a benefit in the short run. Their productivity and hence their profits are temporarily high. But in the long run, that information goes into the public domain and everybody benefits from it. So the individual's not able to recoup his Costs and hence will be under investment in knowledge. But the simplest thing you could do in economics is when the market's not working, you can design a tax subsidy scheme to get things back to efficiency. So tau happens to be um, 
the subsidy you want to make. So, you know, the Canada Council used to give out, uh, the Canada Council doctoral fellowships to subsidize your PhD program. I guess they probably still do. Uh, and this tells you what it should be. Uh, in terms of abstract reasoning, it, G prime is the marginal increase in knowledge creation from having more successes. The expected value of sigma is the expected number of successes for a given number of innovators. Then I have to divide that by G of n because I wanted to talk about the average individual. And I capitalize it by dividing by R because knowledge, unlike love, lasts forever. So when somebody comes up with a new idea and that increases productivity, it may become obsolete later, but we're always building on previous ideas. So this little formula just tells you how you know, an undergraduate public finance professor on his homework assignment would say, come up with the optimal subsidy for innovation. You just grind it out. Now, let's talk about something interesting. I mean, this is kind of interesting so far, but it's relatively standard. Let's jazz it up by talking about technology transfer. Innovators have ideas. They sometimes meet other people, th these MBAs I'm calling entrepreneurs, who may have comparative advantage in implementation. But I'm going to, for now, assume that these ideas are traded in a market with perfect credit. So, so far, there's no financial frictions. Remember, the, the, the method I'm using is to show you some simple models, make them more complicated until we get something that actually we can handle it, but it's a bit surprising. So here we go. And this time, I'm going to turn it the right way. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Damn. <laughs> okay, here we go. I should hire somebody. Here, here's the timeline. This is probably more complicated than it need be, but the general idea is, remember, N sub E is some measure of people called entrepreneurs. And what I'm going to do is say there's, within a period, something like I did yesterday, entrepreneurs and uh, innovators could meet. Oh, by the way, I mean, just, in this one more piece of notation, sigma i is a random variable. For an innovator, it's the probability he'll be able to implement his idea in that given period. Sigma e is the probability the entrepreneur could implement it. And it's going to be another random variable distributed according to some joint distribution of sigma i, sigma e. So, so within a period, in the first sub-period, innovators come up with ideas. Then I'm going to randomly match entrepreneurs and innovators. Why random matching? It's just the easiest, maybe not the easiest, it's the first way to do it. Uh, extensions of this uh, use directed search, but maybe not perfectly directed search because when, when venture capitalists and entrepreneurs get together, it is a bit random. They don't, it takes a while to sort it out. Just like in the labor market or as I said, the marriage market, there's an element of randomness to the matching process. Now if I and E meet, they may or may not trade. There are gains from trade if sigma e exceeds sigma i. So I'm a PhD, I meet an MBA, here's my idea. And if they have a greater success rate, what I should do, well, there's many things you can do in the real world. One thing you can do is do a joint project or a licensing agreement. The world is complicated. I'm going to focus on the case where I sell the idea outright to the entrepreneur, okay? which is actually kind of important, especially in software and some biomedical uh, markets. Uh, one reason is the, the, the programmer doesn't want to get wrapped up in implementation. He wants to sell off his idea and go back to the drawing board. Other reasons why it's good to sell off your idea, if we try to do a joint project, all of a sudden we have a bunch of incentive problems about, you know, I'm maybe shirking in the implementation project. Maybe you're not carrying your weight. So if you can sell the idea outright, although that's only one example of how, how uh, technology gets reallocated. It's, it's an interesting example. Okay, that, at the end of that market for ideas, we close that market and set up the market we had before where individuals produce, consume, buy assets, etc. So that's my model with technology transfer. Oh, we're going to assume if you're an economist, you know they gave the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago to the search theorists who came up with the idea about how to describe the matching process. So I, I like the, the introduction of the introduction where it's talking about econo economists thinking about how people interact. Uh, most economists don't, at least uh, general equipment theorists don't. I was taught in my first course on game theory that economics is far and away the most successful social science 
because you took all the social aspect out. You maximize utility submit to a budget constraint. You can go anywhere on your budget line you want. You don't have to find a counterparty. You don't need to negotiate over price. That's not the right way to do economics, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, it depends on the issue. But here, the market for ideas is characterized by bilateral trade. Individuals are finding each other and trading with each other. So the first thing you got to do is say, how do people meet? And the, the guys who won the Nobel Prize came up with this way. If there's NI um, innovators in the market and NE entrepreneurs, there's some function denoted mu, which tells you the total number of bilateral matches. It's a technology. Of course, you can model that more deeply, but for now, I'm going to use that exogenous matching function. So basically, the probability for, say, an entrepreneur of meeting an innovator is mu, the total number of matches, divided by NE, the number of entrepreneurs. So this is the way economists now standardly theorize about who trades with whom, what well, this tells you, who meets whom, and then we're going to see what happens. And because it's a bilateral gain from trade situation, they're not going to take prices as given by some auctioneer. They're going to bargain over prices. And the bargain, uh, we use standard bargaining theory. It generates a very nice, simple outcome. The entrepreneur is going to have to transfer some purchasing power. I'm not going to say money, because I think too deeply about monetary economics to bandy about the word money. If you were a GE theorist, in terms of numeraire, so it's purchasing power. And the purchasing power that the um, MBA will have to give me to get my idea is a weighted average. Theta is my, sorry, theta is the MBA's bargaining power. So it's going to weight my success rate and their success rate. The higher is my success rate, the more I'll demand in payment. The higher is their success rate, the more they'll be willing to offer. I only multiply it by delta because I'm sure you all remember that delta was the gain from successful implementation in utility terms. So delta just turns profits into utils. Now, we're starting to get something a little less trivial. The economy operates the same as the basic growth aspect. There's a growth rate G, but now the number of successful innovations is, well, there's some baseline success rate. That's the first term. If there's n entrepreneurs, and on average they succeed with some probability, that gives you the total number of successes. But we have to add on to it the new successes generated by technology transfer. So um, mu is the number of meetings between entrepreneurs and uh, innovators. And sigma is the gain from trade. So I have to take the expected value of the increase in probability when I transfer the technology to somebody with more expertise. The reason I start the integral, I only integrate for sigma epsilon greater than sigma i, is if I meet an MBA who's worse than I am, there's no gains from trade. So if you don't, you don't need to worry with the technical formulas, but the, the, the notion we're trying to capture here is by realloc reallocating ideas from those who come up with the idea to others who may be more expertise at implementing them, we can get more successes in the innovation process, and that's going to improve growth. Now, we can ask the same question we asked before. Now we not only have innovators who may have to pay to come up with ideas. On the other side of the market, we have entrepreneurs who have to pay to become entrepreneurs that get some expertise at implementation. And the growth rate depends on a bunch of factors, and it's not efficient. First, you have the knowledge externality, the same as before. Innovators don't take into account that when they succeed, it not only gives them higher short-run profit, it makes the world a better place in the long run. And entrepreneurs don't take into account that when they enter the market, buy an implementation idea, and if they're successful, they can increase their profit. But their implementation success also has implications for the long run. So there's too little entry for that reason. However, what we know from search theory is there are also what are called search externalities. Uh, in the labor market, if there's too many firms looking for workers, there's congestion. So these firms are paying an entry cost, but it's a bit like a rat race. They're all trying to hire the best worker, and they're all, there's not enough workers to go around. So the optimal subsidy for both 
MBAs and PhDs is going to somehow take into account both the fact that they're creating knowledge through ideas and through implementation, but also you've got to try to get the market to balance the right numbers on both sides so there's not too much congestion. And uh, Arthur Hosio at Toronto is kind of a famous guy because he came up with this condition in the labor market. You have to have wages set just right to get the right market tightness, the right ratio between firms trying to hire and workers looking for work. So this is a generalization of his formula. It just takes into account not only do you have to get the right market tightness of, in this case, entrepreneurs and innovators, you also want more of both because they're creating knowledge. And again, um, maybe not in an undergraduate public finance course, but in a graduate, standard methods would allow you to compute these formulas. So the point is, the market's not efficient in general. And we can correct it if we have recourse to taxes and subsidies. But I want to now move on to something bigger. Or not bigger, I mean, maybe bigger, different. Before when I said that if you want my idea, and I'm willing to give it to you because you have comparative advantage, I said you have to pay me. And I said there was perfect credit. You're just going to promise me in the next market you will deliver purchasing power to me. And I believe you. Like I believe Steve when he said he'd pay me $25 for my weights. But of course, you know, actual MBAs are more sophisticated. Uh, and, and even some PhDs, they, they take into account that there's limited commitment. You make promises to pay and you may renege. So credit's going to be incomplete here. It's particularly important for ideas. If you don't pay the mortgage on your house or your car loan, they take your house or they take your car. If I give you my knowledge and you don't pay, it's hard to repossess the knowledge. Now that's why we have patents and intellectual property rights and everything else. Those institutions do not cure the problem. Their very existence points out that there is a problem. So when you're selling your idea, if you're a software developer and you, wanna, you have an idea for some new something or other, and you want to sell it to an established firm, you may be reluctant to give them credit because they may not honor their obligation. And in fact, in software, it's particularly important. I've been told that in the days when there weren't such stringent intellectual property rights, especially for software, much development went on in-house. You didn't want to break off on your own as a developer because when you sold your idea to the companies, I mean, it wasn't so clear that market worked well. Now that there's better institutions for honoring intellectual property, et cetera, now there's much more independent development and people selling their ideas upstream. So institutions do develop to try to take into account these issues, but still, in general, there's not perfect credit. I want to know how that impinges on the growth rate of the economy. Yes, when there's not perfect credit, the way trade works, like I talked about yesterday in my econ seminar, is loans or deals may have to be collateralized. This introduces a new role for these assets that have been in the background for now. So now, um, when you say you want my idea and promise to pay me later, you can secure the loan by using your assets as collateral. This is an important and, and relevant and I believe correct notion of liquidity. Assets in the model convey liquidity because if you have assets, you can put them up as collateral to secure a loan. Hence, I'm more inclined to give you things in general on credit and to transfer technology in particular on credit. So, um, yeah, there's two ways to uh, think about the way assets facilitate trade. In my work on it with Kiyotaki, uh, we talked about money and you would actually give me the assets to finalize the deal. We have closure. A different approach, which is mostly different just as a relabeling, is Kiyotaki's work with John Moore, which is very popular recently. There you don't give me the assets and finalize the deal. You promise me payment and purchasing power. Only if you renege can I seize your assets. For the equations, that doesn't matter. Okay. In both cases, the assets are being used to facilitate transactions. Now, bargaining is as before. If you want my idea, I'll tell it to you. You're supposed to make me a payment P. However, you're constrained. Any promised payment you make, if it's too high, I know you're going to renege on that. 
When will you not renege? Well, when the promised payment is no bigger than the value of your assets, you'd rather honor your obligation than forfeit the collateral. So I know exactly the highest amount of credit I'm willing to offer you. And that amount of credit is described by the value of your assets. Um, it turns out that the value of the assets, uh, so you get the dividends from the tree, and the dividends are worth Z. You can turn these dividends into output using the frontier technology, but you can also resell the assets at price phi. So phi plus Z, sorry, phi plus Z over Z uh, is basically the value of the assets you can either transfer to me or use to secure the loan. I will not, you cannot promise a payment bigger than that. So this is, this is very abstract, I understand that, but it captures something. It captures the idea that there's gains from trade in, in technology or in, or in ideas, but these gains from trade are stymied by the fact that the credit doesn't work that well. And you know, most economists these days are thinking seriously about credit market imperfections in the wake of the so-called financial crisis. This is a typical way of formalizing that idea. OK, this little box describes what happens in, in the market for ideas. So sigma i is my success rate. I meet you. Sigma e is your success rate if I transfer the, the idea to you. So below the 45 degree line, there's no gains from trade. I'd rather go solo. I don't need you. Above the 45 degree line, there is gains from trade. And with perfect credit, so first of all, when I say above the 45 degree line, any bilateral meeting is characterized by a, a pair, my success rate if I go solo, and your success rate if you take over the project. In meetings where there's gains from trade because your sigma is higher than mine, uh, that means above the 45 degree line, it's socially efficient for me to transfer the idea to you. But if you don't have enough liquidity, if the assets you can use to facilitate the trade aren't worth that much, the deal's not going to go through. So um, there are parts of the graph above the 45 degree line, but where uh, the non-shaded white triangle, you see right this area here, there's social gains from trade, but we can't close the deal because you don't have the resources to make the payment. So that's a socially inefficient outcome. So in fact, we can characterize, just like we did before, the growth rate. The growth rate will be, as in the previous version, the, the baseline growth rate, some number of entrepreneurs times the average success rate, plus the gains from the increase in the number of successes due to technology transfer. So I'm going to integrate the same object, but over a smaller set, because sometimes there's gains from trade, but the deal falls through. And that's bad for growth. Interestingly, two things pop up that weren't there before. Actually, three things. I'll start with the um, less remarkable. Um, the turns out in an environment like this, assets are priced above their fundamental level. The fundamental value of the asset is the present discounted value of the dividend stream. You as an entrepreneur are willing to pay more than that to get the asset because the asset allows you to, to it facilitates your exchange in the market for ideas. Uh, so agents are willing to pay for liquidity. The asset is priced above its fundamental. The difference is the so-called liquidity premium, which is the amount you'd be willing to pay to hold assets not only for their return but for their liquidity. That's not so remarkable. This comes out of um, Monetary Theory 101. Although 10 years ago, I would have found that totally mysterious. But the frontier has moved. Now, two things that come out which are less obvious, uh, so I guess this was actually pretty obvious too. A higher number or a higher quantity of liquid assets increases the growth rate. Why? Because technology transfer and hence successful implementation is being hindered by a lack of collateral. For sure, a lack of collateral stymies all investments, but in particular, trying to buy information or buy knowledge. And that's bad for growth because we can't reallocate information from those who come up with it to those who are better able to implement it because me as an innovator, 
I'm worried you might not be able to make the payment. And if there's not enough liquid assets to go around, well, their price goes up, so the value of liquidity tries to compensate that, but still there's not enough to go around. And many people think this is kind of a big deal in the real world. There's, you know, there's a shortage of assets which are available to collateralize loans. That's not so difficult to conceive of, maybe. But this next one is um, bargaining power. So this holder problem I mentioned when I sold my weights to Steve, it's kind of the same idea in this market. When I make, so there's several holder problems. When I first pay the cost to become an innovator and you pay the cost to become an entrepreneur, at the bargaining stage, you may not be able to recoup those costs. So there's going to be underinvestment. Those can be corrected by the tax subsidy programs I was alluding to earlier. There's an additional holder problem. When you bring liquidity as an entrepreneur to the market, you're making an investment. You're paying more for the asset than its fundamental value. So when we get together in our bilateral meeting and we negotiate, I'm going to give you my idea in exchange for either a payment collateralized by your asset or you just hand over the asset. You're going to say you want a good deal because you, know, you made this investment in liquidity. It's like me saying to Steve, I want a high price for my weights because I went to all the trouble. I paid the cost to carry them upstairs. And he's a, what's a good economist going to say to that? He's going to say, that's a sunk cost. Like with opportunity costs and these other, you know, this jargon for economics that's actually important. Sunk cost is a key concept about the real world. Whether Steve pays me $25 or $12, I still have to bear the cost. It's already sunk. I already carried the weights upstairs. And that's what I, as an innovator, will say to the entrepreneur. You may have invested in liquidity, which was a cost for you. That's sunk. You've already paid that cost. So I'm going to charge you a high price. This is kind of a new idea in, in, in monetary or finance theory, because most people, in, in, especially in finance, they always assume competitive pricing. Once you start putting more realistic uh, pricing mechanisms in like bargaining, new phenomenon emerge. And it's, it's no big deal. I mean, I should have known it when I was in high school because of the weightlifting fiasco. So to get efficiency, the next slide is going to give you the formulas, probably. Yeah, there's some more about, I don't have no idea how long I'm supposed to go or how long I've gone. So I'm just going to keep chatting until I run out of slides. But we're, we're not too far from the end. Because I get paid by the hour, right? <laughs> OK. So an equilibrium is getting to be a more and more complicated object. I don't just need wages and asset prices. I mean, I need all those things, but I also need, a, I need to know the price of assets and a, a variety of other things. But I can characterize the equilibrium that is the prediction of this theory and the outcome is inefficient, no surprise. The very first example I gave you, uh, the outcome was inefficient because knowledge is a public good. To get efficiency now, it turns out you need three things. First off, you have to have the corrective tax subsidies, just like in all the examples. You want to you provide incentives for research and entrepreneurship because this creates knowledge which is a public good. You have to be careful not to over-subsidize because if there's too many people in the market, they're going to congest each other. And you also have to try to get market tightness right. That's pretty standard. You also need an abundant supply of liquidity that is assets that can function as collateral or a means of payment, either way. And as I say, many people seem to think the world is characterized these days by a shortage of good collateral. And finally, you need to have entrepreneurs, that is, you guys trying to buy my ideas. I mean, at, we, you are as we speak. Um, I need to have all the bargaining, sorry, you need to have all the bargaining power in that deal. Your bargaining power should be one. That's the way for you to recoup all of your otherwise sunk costs. You should take all the gains from trade because you were the guys who actually made the investment in liquidity. And the general rule of thumb behind the famous Hosio's condition is to get efficient investment, the person who made the investment should, should what's the word I'm, I guess recoup or should, should get the gains generated by that investment instead of being held up by the other side of the trade. 
So since it was the uh, entrepreneurs who made the investment in liquidity, they should get the gains from trade for efficiency. And that requires you having all the bargaining power. Now, that is kind of different in you, and I think it's important. Uh, similar insights are what allowed us in the area to conclude that inflation is much more costly than economists used to think. This holdup problem in bilateral bargaining, it, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, put it to you this way, suppose I had all the bargaining power, then you would get none of the gains from trade. So you're not going to invest in liquidity at all. Okay, so bargaining power can be really important for splitting the gains from trade correctly so that we get efficient investments. So that's in other papers, as I say, papers on the cost of inflation and, and some other areas. But it's kind of a new, new application to, to growth theory. The next thing I'm going to show you is quite new. This is where theory is useful. Sometimes things emerge from the theory that surprised the person writing down the model. If I can just figure out which of these buttons to press. Nope. Yes. We studied a model with innovation, but no technology transfer. Got simple policy to correct the externalities. Then we added technology transfer with perfect credit markets. Then we put imperfections in the credit market, basically limited commitment, which meant that deals had to be collateralized. And we saw an additional pair of inefficiencies. We needed a high abundance of liquid assets, and we needed the person investing in liquidity to have all the bargaining power. Now I'm going to talk about intermediation. Why? Well, there's a long tradition, as I say, of people thinking that financial development uh, is good for growth. They don't really know why, but I mean, you can imagine at an intuitive level, if you want to make some investments, if you can go to a bank and get a loan, you can make more investments. I'm going to show you something that's novel, or at least I never guessed it beforehand. Yeah, so what I'm going to do, you don't need to read this. Um, there's some names on there. Uh, I'm going to introduce banking into the model. The names are meant for people who work in economics or finance to say, oh, the diamond dipping model, I sort of know how that works. But it's all pretty simple. Basically, the market for ideas is open. And there's a bunch of you uh, entrepreneurs out there and a bunch of innovators, and we match bilaterally. You all have some liquidity. You have access to liquid assets to use to collateralize the loan. Now, some of you may meet some uh, innovator with an idea that's not so great, so you, you're not even constrained you give them 20 bucks for the idea. Like, here's an idea. Open up a Canadian restaurant in Rio de Janeiro. No, it's five bucks for that idea. A Brazilian restaurant in Waterloo, now there's a good idea, okay? So some ideas aren't so good, the price is low. You actually have excess liquidity. But then somebody else is in a bilateral meeting where there's huge gains from trade. They don't have enough liquidity to close the deal. The way these intermediaries these banks work is people with excess liquidity can deposit in a financial institution. The financial institution could make loans to people in need of more liquidity. So the role of banking in these kinds of models is to reallocate liquidity from those who currently have more than they need to those who have less than they would like. Now, when you deposit your liquidity into the bank, you're going to earn some interest on it. How can the bank pay you interest? By charging other people who take loans. So this reallocation of liquidity uh, comes at a price, just like the reallocation of apples or bananas. If you want more of my apples, you've got to give me something. But there's, there's a role for banking in this kind of environment. Now notice it, it kind of requires, there's many ingredients in the model. They're all kind of integral to the theory. It's important there's gains from trade. It's important that it's bilateral so you can have really big gains from trade. When Sonia has a sort of little gains from trade because she's talking to me about her thesis and what do I know? So she doesn't need much to pay me. And then it's important that there's, um, as I say, bilateral. So you know, it's not just a bunch of buyers and a bunch of sellers and supply equals demand. The bargaining component is, is integral as well. So financial intermediaries here reallocate liquidity from those who have more than the need to those who would like more. And 
this is kind of good because the next slide, this is probably almost, oh, it just, just says, again, the box describes every p potential bilateral meeting is characterized by my success rate and your success rate. Below the 45 degree line, there's no gains from trade. If you have any liquidity, you'll deposit it. Above the 45 degree line, there's gains from trade. Uh, to the left, it's like when Sonia was talking to me, she didn't need all of her liquid assets to get my expertise. So she had liquidity left over, she also deposits. But then people in this region here, they actually are in a situation where there's a great deal to be done. If they just had more assets to close the deal, they could and they would. So they're going to be borrowing. Now, we get some trade here where we didn't have it without banks. We also lose some because this line here is no longer the 45 degree line. Because, you know, when you try to buy the idea, you not only have to take account the cost, you got to pay the interest on the loan. And that interest rate will be positive if at the aggregate level there's not enough liquidity to go around. Okay. So that picture describes the outcome. I keep saying I think it's my last slide, but this is the main result. And by the way, my kind of work, it's not really about anything. <laughs> I don't take super seriously those formulas for you know, the Canada Council doctoral fellowship should be this amount of money. I'm more interested in method. So I want to show you what monetary economists do and how we think. I have some results, but it's the method that I think is actually way more important. Um, results are results. It's like you give a man a fish and then he eats a fish, but I show you how to do monetary theory. You know, you could fish for the rest of your life now. You can use these tools. The nice thing about this new monetary theory that some of us are mostly Canadians, Steve Williamson, Xu Yangshi, Narayana Kochal, Kota, David Andalfato, and mostly Canadians, who knows why. It's new and it's easy. So econometrics, it's hard, right? I wouldn't know, but they say it's hard. This stuff is at the level of basically, there's some conceptual ideas, but the mathematics is at the level of advanced undergraduate. There's nothing hard here. So I'm pushing this talk as a way to encourage people not to believe every substantive result I present, but maybe take seriously this way of thinking about economics. It's new and it's not hard. Having said that, here is my substantive result. In this world with many complications, I'm going to tell you how to get the efficient outcome. You need three things. Actually, you only need, yeah, you need, you need two things. It's like Monty Python. Six things you need. Um, as always, you have to subsidize innovation and entrepreneurial activity because they're creating knowledge and knowledge is a public good. So having set those subsidies correctly, again, balancing, achieving the right market tightness as well as uh, stimulating the creation of knowledge, let's move on to see what else you need. You need to have a sufficient supply of liquid assets. That's what we had last time. But notice with banks, this one's not a big deal, but it's still important to understand. With banks, you can get efficiency. Now you need, only need liquidity to be above A double star. Before, you needed it above A star, and A double star is lower. No surprise. If you have to use the liquidity you brought to the market, we need a lot of liquid assets to close all the deals. The role of the bank is to take scarce liquidity and reallocate it to its most important uses so the economy can get by and still achieve efficiency with fewer liquid assets. That's an important role for banks. The next one is more surprising because the majority of economists don't do bargaining and they're wed to competitive pricing. I mean, not in I.O. or some other fields, but in growth theory they sure are. Uh, Guess what? I had three conditions in the model without banks. I said that entrepreneurs had to have all the bargaining power. I don't need that anymore. This surprised me. Banks solve the holdup problem. And do you know why? Do you both say, no, professor? Because it's supposed to be a surprise. And maybe I'm just dumb, but I never knew this. Here's the way it works. So you bring your liquid assets to the market, and you tell me, you want a good price to get my idea. And I say, dude, that's a sunk cost. You've already invested in liquidity. 
your only outside option is to carry those assets forward. So I'm going to try to rip you off, and that leads to underinvestment and liquidity, because you know you're going to get ripped off. If banks are open, your outside option is better. Instead of simply carrying those liquid assets forward, you can put your assets in the bank, or however, whatever we want to call this financial institution. Your assets can be reallocated to people who need them more. So you have a credible outside option. If I don't give you a good deal, you can walk away. And it's no longer a sunk cost because you can actually sell that liquidity through the financial intermediary to somebody else. So the fact that you're not stuck with the, liquid, with the liquidity, you can actually have it reallocated to somebody else, gives you a credible threat. And hence, I can't hold you up. I didn't know that. So banking is not only useful because it reallocates liquidity to its scarce, to where it's needed, and it's a scarce resource. It allows for strategic implications. People who've invested in liquidity now have an outside option. They could rent it out or sell it off to somebody through a financial intermediary. So that's new. Is it quantitatively relevant? The paper has a whole section on running regressions, and, and I don't have anything to say about that. Um, whether it's empirically relevant or not, I'm not sure I care. This is a way to think about a lot of different problems, and you get some economic insights. The applications you may choose to pursue may be really important for policy or for the data. You know, I think of myself more as a guy teaching tools. So you can implement it any way you want. As long as you pay me for my ideas, we've got a deal. And uh, conclusion, I'm done. Uh, there's a bunch of other junk. There's some economic history in the paper. For the historians, I should have tried to talk about this. But the people who take this idea seriously of technology trans transfer, and don't look at these slides. I'm kinda, I don't want you to see anything else. I'll leave it there. This just simply catalogs with no credit, perfect credit, constrained credit, and intermediated credit. You get different outcomes, and I just wanted to list that's what we did. And the last thing is the conclusion. But as I was saying, I think of myself as a guy who helps build tools. And you know, this is the little applied paper. It's not a pure theory paper, but this is only my, my preferences. I prefer that I give these tools to other people and let them put them to use. So that's the end of my slides, and I guess that's the end of my talk. Um, I think you're supposed to clap now. <laughs> And I also think we're supposed, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, so that's a good question. The question is uh, how can banks do something like reallocate liquidity to its most useful person, and second, help get around this holdup problem, because why doesn't the bank hold people up? OK, so banks are institutions that are relatively big, who have a history and a future. For them, reputation is really important. These technology transfers, it's more like one-off trades between people. So you know, if I, if I told you, trust me, I'll pay you $1,000 tomorrow, you might not trust me. If I gave you my you know, Bank of Montreal credit card, we could do a deal. I trust the bank, the bank trusts me. You trust the bank, the bank trusts you. We just don't trust each other. And why would that be? Because I'm dealing with you today and I'll probably never see you again. But me and the Bank of Montreal, we got a long-term relationship. So that relationship, could, they have reputational considerations which allows banks to have more credibility. Indeed, I wrote a paper recently uh, which was all about who should be a banker. It should be people who are obviously trustworthy. And then why would they be trustworthy? Well, maybe they've got a lot to lose because they have investments elsewhere in the economy. Maybe they, they're dealing with lots of people, so destroying their reputation would be very costly for them. This paper's not modeling that, but look in Review of Economic Studies last year is a paper called Banking, a New Monetarist Approach, and it's all about your question. My pleasure. Oh, yes. So, so maybe the, uh, this goes to some of the slides that you very briefly showed at the end. But 
I'm interested in the exchange of ideas uh, and how we might model that maybe uh, a little bit better with more depth. And specifically, when, when we think about... You say I gave a shallow talk? <laughs> exactly. When we think about the exchange of ideas, uh, we might think, for example, the, the example of the guy that invented the windshield washers. Uh, he didn't have the complementary assets to actually commercialize that, so he went to an entrepreneur, Ford or whatever, uh, and as soon as he told him about it, you can't actually write a contract on the exchange of the idea, so Ford just took it and walked away. So here we're actually assuming that you can make that transaction. Is, are we thinking about different types of ideas? Yeah, different types of ideas, yeah. So um, this comes up, there's various ways in which uh, people have maybe ideas. So you're thinking more of what looks to me like a venture capital kind of situation. I have an idea, what I'm lacking is the capital and maybe sometimes the expertise. So a venture capitalist will form a partnership with me where he both can funnel resources to, to finance my investments and additionally bring to bear his expertise in the problem. Venture capital is a relatively small part of the, uh, of the market, of the investment market, but it's important because they tend to, to, to invest in high varies but potentially very high reward enterprises. So, you know, I can make up Apple and all the good firms you've heard of in the last 25 years, many of them are venture cap. This is not that. This is a different kind of idea transfer. This is the one where I have the idea. I don't want a partner. I don't even want your funds to, to work on the project. I want to sell my idea outright. That's also a relatively small part of the market, although in, in some of our data say that in Germany, it looks like about 8% to 13% of the technological improvements firms get are from direct purchase in this fashion. So it's, it's sizable for advanced countries. We only focused on that one aspect. I'm doing other work on venture capital was much more like you had in mind. I don't consider that a deeper model. It's just an alternative part of the same market. These tools can be brought to bear, that brought to bear on those problems too. So, it, so it's important. You know, I should say this, partnerships have all kind of inefficiencies. Often it's better for me to sell the idea outright and move on. That way you internalize all of your own investments in the, in the project, because you're the guy who owns it and gets the returns. However, in venture capital, you don't want to buy my idea because you actually need a partner to work hand in hand on development. And that's just a different kind of ideas. But, but I guess I'm asking how you can fundamentally sell an idea ah. if you can't write a contract yeah. selling the idea. And, you, you know, if, if you tell me I will pay you a million dollars after you tell me the idea and I say, well, my idea was you should, you should have a Brazilian restaurant. And, uh, and, and if you can't contract on it, how can you actually make that exchange? So that's precisely why I have these assets collateralizing the deal. Okay, I mean the simplest way to think of it is when someone wants my idea, they just hand over the assets. So it's a spot trade. I take the credit out of it. Now that doesn't fully satisfy you, I'm sure. There's other frictions in the market that I'm not talking about. Informational frictions are really important in the idea market for at least two reasons. One, you tell me it's a good idea, but you know, how do I know? Could be a lemon. Uh, another aspect of it is if we do form a partnership, um, you claim to be working hard every day on the project, but you're probably you know, watching wrestling or something. So th these informational frictions are important. We abstract from those in this exercise because that's what everybody else has studied. Everybody, since Ken Arrow wrote the first paper on, on ideas, he said ideas are tricky because you tell me it's a good idea, but I don't know. I can only know if you give it to me, and once you give it to me, you can't take it back. So this paper has abstracted from that because there's many other studies of that. We wanted to focus on something different. How do we formally uh, discuss that issue? So, you know, if you have an idea for, for uh, say, a new kind of vehicle, you can show me the prototype and convince me that it's a good idea. But I can't actually use it until you give me the blueprint. So the, the prototype is a way of conveying information to me about the quality of your idea but I can't take the prototype and reverse engineer the blueprint so easily, hence I may be still willing to pay you for the details. You know, in the restaurant example, I could taste the Brazilian food and say this is pretty good, but unless you give me the recipe, I can't cook it. 
and, and that's certainly, that's not the last word on that problem. Thinking about informational frictions in economics is a first order problem. Most economists who think about frictions think only about private information. I wanted to bring to bear search and matching, bargaining and liquidity because I wanted to talk about something different. So I'm glad you asked that so I can clarify. Question. Stand up, please. So for the perfect credit case and the intermediate credit case, uh, which one is better? Does this depend? It's, it's ambiguous. It's, does this depend on the interest rate? Does yes. Is your interest rate endogenous? Yes. Uh, does that relate to the growth rate? Yes. <laughs> so, okay, perfect credit. Um, you don't need assets. So what was your question about intermediate credit versus constrained credit? No, uh -huh. intermediate versus perfect, mm -hmm. right. Banks could help, and how they help is by moving liquidity around to get it into the hands of the people who need it most. But they can't create liquidity. There's only so much to go around. So with perfect credit, that, that asset, that thing I call the tree, a Lucas tree, that was totally irrelevant. With perfect credit, you don't need collateral. Now, so, th so adding imperfect credit, then the market got much worse. Using assets to collateralize loans helped. Didn't help all the way. Adding banks help even more, but they don't get you back to perfect credit necessarily. Okay. So it's ambiguous as you go across these regimes, which one. So obviously, uh, no credit's the worst. Perfect credit's the best. Uh, and constrained credit's not so good. Banks help. They don't go all the way. The interest rate is pinned down so that if, if liquidity is scarce, those who have too much are willing to put it in the financial institution. Those who have not enough want to take some out. But how do you allocate this resource, liquidity, when it's scarce? You use the price mechanism. The interest rate on loans will clear that market. Okay? And if there's, if there's plenty of liquidity at the aggregate level, then it won't be scarce and the interest rate will go to zero so you do get back to the best. But if liquidity is in scarce supply, the banks can't solve that problem. Okay, just uh, on top of that, I'm wondering uh, what type of policy implication will come out from this paper other than subsidize uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship? Yeah. So that's a great question. The easy one is to run a deflation at the Friedman rule which means liquidity will no longer be scarce because currency will have a good rate of return and people can use currency. They don't need to use other assets for liquidity. Now, that's, kind of, that's a pretty strong prediction, but that prediction doesn't come out of this only. Any kind of in, imperfect credit market model, you can replace credit with monetary exchange and as long as you run a good monetary policy, the liquidity problem goes away. But you know, I wouldn't... I wouldn't push that too far because monetary exchange may come with its own set of problems. But certainly, if the problem is scarce liquidity, let people use money. The only reason we don't use cash for everything in, in the context of this model is that the inflation rate is too high. Okay? Now, don't forget, if everything was a currency transaction, it would induce other problems like, you know, uh, it's hard to keep records, hard to do taxes. It encourages theft and other illegal activity. But the simplest way to address the shortage of liquidity is keep inflation low. So we have the room until uh, 5 o'clock, so we can hang around if people have other questions. And then there's a reception over an environment afterwards. But we have uh, Doug Pierce, the Dean of Arts. Uh, and I'm not going to bother with the mic. Oh, yeah. uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I learned a lot of things in the last hour and a half, uh, most of which I'm going to have to take uh, for granted, one of which was that he said it was new and not hard. As somebody who, back before many of you were born, struggled through intro to micro, intro to macro, it may be new, but it is hard. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to defer to you on all that. Um, I'm delighted. Uh, it was a great talk. I thought it was particularly appropriate because this focus upon tech transfer and entrepreneurship, that's what the university here yeah. celebrates and talks about. And be able to think through, and again, I'm deferring on the math to you, but thinking through those relationships and the role and how we in the social sciences and in arts 
can contribute to those kinds of discussions, I think is particularly worthwhile. So I was glad by the talk. I'm thrilled with the turnout. And because you're from Winnipeg, I'm not even going to bother apologizing for the weather. <laughs> Welcome home. And again, thank you everybody for coming out. And uh, again, I encourage you to, to come to the reception if you've got any further questions. Uh, I'm not going to ask you anything because it just exposes how much <laughs> I've forgotten from microeconomics and macroeconomics, which, and from a textbook, which I now understand is no longer probably in print. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.